In this lecture, we're going to discuss what are known as multiplicative functions. So multiplicative functions are a special class in a larger class of functions uh, that are called arithmetical functions. So an arithmetic, arithmetic or arithmetical, so this is an adjective, basically means number theoretical. Uh, so an arithmetic function um, is just a function that's defined on the natural numbers. So our domain is going to be uh, the natural numbers, use the symbol n, and uh, the codomain can sort of be whatever, often it'll be z, um, in general it'll be the complex numbers, so these are allowed to even map uh, natural numbers to complex numbers, but the key is that it's defined on the natural numbers. Um, some books will say this is the whole definition there. Um, obviously, there, this can be a lot of things. Uh, you could just always map everything to the number 5, for example. Um, that wouldn't be so interesting, though. So often, uh, these are going to capture some kind of number theoretic um, information. So one example could be um, it's a really important function in number theory. It's called pi, so pi of n. Uh, this is the, defined as the uh, number of primes up to and including n, so less than or equal to n. Um, so for example, uh, pi of 10 is 4 because we have uh, the primes 2, 3, 5, 7. Uh, better example, pi of 100. Uh, I think we actually found all the primes earlier up to 100. Um, if you count them all, you should get 25. Um, and etc. So that's one example of an arithmetic function. Uh, another example is uh, the function that counts the divisors of a number. So uh, this is called tau of n. So it's the Greek letter tau. Um, pretty sure this comes from the German word for divisor, which starts with a T. Uh, but often this, this function this function also has some other names. So some people call it d of n. Uh, some people call it sigma zero of n. Uh, I'll explain that a bit more later. Uh, but yeah, what is this function? It just counts the number of divisors of n. So it's the number of divisors. Of, uh, of this number n. And um, I think this one's worth uh, making a little table, actually. So this one we're going to study a fair bit today. Because it turns out this function has some, some rather nice properties. Um, so let's uh, put n up here and then tau of n down here. So n is going to start at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Fourteen, fifteen, we can keep going. Um, so, one has one divisor, two has one divisor, uh, other than itself. But we're going to count all the divisors. So, well, let me just emphasize that because I think we talked about divisors before, but we were sort of talking about proper divisors. So, so we want a number of all divisors of n, including the number itself. So, two is a prime, so it has like two divisors, one and itself. Uh, 3 also has two divisors, 5, 7, I'm going to just go to the primes and say those all have two divisors. Um, how about 4? Four? 4 has um, 1, 2, and 4, so it's going to have three divisors. 6 has 1, 2, 3, and 6, that's four divisors. 8 has four divisors. 9 has three divisors, 1, 3, and 9. 10 has 4 divisors, 12 has a lot of divisors, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12, so it's going to be 6, uh, this one's going to be 4, 4, so if we go one more, 16 has 5 divisors. Um, Alright, so this is a function tau of n, and as you can see it uh, behaves a bit, a bit randomly, 
Um, got some big jumps. Um, can't often predict what's what's going to come next. Um, but th there is actually a, a fairly interesting pattern here. Um, it's a bit tough to notice, but um, for example, we could look at uh, the 12 here. So 12 uh, has six divisors. Uh, well, 12 is 4 times 3. And if you look at a number of divisors of 3 and a number of divisors of 4, it looks like the product 2 times 3 is 6. So in other words, we have this, uh, this relationship. So t of 3 times t of 4 is t of 12. 12 is 3 times 4. Um, well, you might say that this, is, this doesn't always seem to work, right? Because 12 is also 2 times 6, but uh, t tau of 2 times 2 is tau of 6. We maybe we would expect that to be tau of 12, but it's not. So this one, is, yeah, this one does not work. Um, but still, this is rather interesting, and you can actually see it happen uh, a few more times here. So, for example, uh, um, 15 has 4 divisors. 15 is 3 times 5. 2 times 2 is 4. Um, and um, so the observation is that sometimes, so sometimes, uh, it seems that, Uh, you can find many more examples if you write out uh, this table further. Uh, it seems that tau of a product of two numbers is equal to tau of a times tau of b. So you can multiply the numbers of divisors together to get the number of divisors here. Uh, but it's only sometimes. This doesn't always work. Uh, let's try to figure out exactly when this works. Um, so um, well, we already know something about this, this function. We have a formula for it. We have a formula for tau of n based on the prime factorization of n. And here's that formula. So, um, uh, right, if n, if n is this product of prime, so p1 to the e1, p2 to the e2, etc., pk to the ek, then tau of n is. So how do we find a number of divisors? Let's just review this really quick. So essentially you can see all the divisors sitting here. You can just take any powers you want and you get a divisor of, of n. If you take zero powers for all of them, you get a divisor of one. Uh, but you can take any, any prime you want in the factorization of n, any power you want up to its exponent. You can't go over its exponent. Um, so essentially if I want a factor of p1, I have, I have e1 plus one choices for that. The plus one because I can choose to take zero of, of this prime. Um, okay, and then I can do the same for, for this prime. Uh, e2 plus one times, I'm multiplying, right? Because for each choice of the exponent here, I can take I have e2 plus one choices of the next one, etc. cetera, uh, until we get to this last term here. Nice thing about this formula is it doesn't actually care about what our primes are. So it just sort of cares about the, the exponents in the prime factorization. Um, so that's rather interesting. And so let's try to figure out what's going on here. So, so let's say our number just had two prime factors um, like this, okay? Well, Let's say we split it up like this. So we'll take this prime and tau of p1 to the e1. Well, what's that going to be? I mean, this, this is just going to have e, e1 plus 1 divisors. We can take any power of this prime we want. And then if we do the same with the second prime power, we get that that's going to have e2 plus 1 divisors. Um, but now tau of this entire number, that's going to be um, have sort of independent choices here because they're different primes. 
So it's going to be e1, e1 plus 1 uh, times e2 plus 1 by our formula. Uh, but you'll notice this is just the same as tau of p1 to the e1 times tau of p2 to the e2. So essentially when you have different primes, you can split apart uh, the product into two, into two parts and then do it separately. So in general, uh, what you can do is if you write n as a product of relatively prime numbers, um, so what, what, what would that mean in terms of the factorization? Uh, well, two numbers will be relatively prime if they don't share any prime factors in common. So for example, if I split these P1 and P2 off and write N as this product times the rest of it, um, I, can, I can sort of do this part separately, multiply it together, uh, uh, fi find the, uh, the number of divisors and then multiply them both together. So, uh, sorry, I said a lot of words there, but let, let's, let's, uh, let's record what we, what we just observed. So. Observe. Uh, in general, so whenever, whenever, uh, let, let, let's write n as, as a product. So whenever um, a and b are relatively prime, so whenever the GCD is one, okay, uh, we have. tau of AB is equal to tau of A times tau of B. And essentially, that's just from our observation here, uh, because A and B are relatively prime, so they'll, they'll involve different primes in the prime factorization, but our formula just involves multiplying all these factors together in the end anyway. Um, so it's a really interesting property here. It only works if, uh, if A and B are relatively prime. So if, if you pick A and B to be not relatively prime. This, this can easily fail, as we've seen here with uh, t of 2 times t of 6. That's not equal to t of 12. Um, but let's abstract this definition so, as a definition. So um, this turns out to, to, to be a really useful observation. Um, so, so in general, a, uh, an arithmetic function Uh, let's call it f of n, uh, that satisfies essentially the same property that tau does. So that satisfies um, f of a product equals f of a times f of b uh, when, whenever a and b are relatively prime. is called multiplicative. So multiplicative means this very precise property. It doesn't mean you can always do this. It just means that when you have two relatively prime numbers, you have two numbers with no factors in common, and f of a b equals f of a times f of b. Okay, so this is multiplicative. Um, okay, furthermore, so furthermore, If, if um, f of a b equals f f of a times f of b with no conditions on a and b, with no conditions on a and b, um, then f is called completely multiplicative. Okay, so even when two numbers are not relatively prime, you still have this property. That's, that's actually rather hard to, to do. Um, but here's an example. So um, in just this function. So f of n equals n, the identity function. So just, uh, so f of 6 would just be 6 itself. This function is completely multiplicative. Um, you can also, you can, you can even raise n to any, any fixed power you want. So f of n equals n to some fixed power. That's also going to be completely multiplicative. Uh, and by the way, that, that even includes a zero power. So 
f of n equals one. Uh, the function is always gives you one. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, yeah, that's definitely gonna be completely multiplicative. Um, okay, we saw tau is multiplicative but not completely multiplicative. It's not completely multiplicative because this property doesn't always work. So it only worked with the three and the four because three and four are relatively prime. Two and six are not relatively prime. They share a factor of two, so this doesn't apply. Uh, but tau is multiplicative. Um, what's an example that's not multiplicative? So, so let's just try this. So, so, so this is a multiplicative function. Uh, an example above is not is not multiplicative. It's an arithmetic function, but it's not multiplicative. Okay. And you can check that prob probably just by trying any two numbers. For example, a, a pi of 100 is not pi of 10 times pi of 10. Um, okay, let's uh, let's investigate this function tau a little bit closer. Is this really important uh, function in, in, in number theory? Um, some people even say number theory is really the study of these arithmetic functions because uh, they just encapsulate so much uh, of what we want to study in number theory. Um, let's look at some facts about about this uh, this function tau. So tau, facts about tau then. Um, Start with maybe some more obvious ones. So, uh, Talvin, sometimes Talvin is two. That uh, happens exactly when. So, Talvin is two if and only if n is prime. Just essentially by definition of prime. Prime, prime numbers are ones with exactly two uh, positive divisors. So, I'm always talking about positive divisors here, by the way. Um, Here's a more interesting one. Can you spot the pattern? So, so some, sometimes n is odd. For example, here, uh, here, and here. So can you spot the pattern there? Um, when, when, when n is 4 and 9, and is, yeah, sometimes tau of n is odd. So when n equals 4, 9, or 16, also 1 itself. So. Uh, it, it appears that when n is a square number, so let's let's record that. So, uh, tau of n is is odd. Uh, this is what we want to prove, maybe. So, if and only if n is a square. Let's see if we can understand why that's true. So, why is this true? Um, well, there are a couple of reasons for it, but but let's uh, let's try to. Um, Prove it from the prime factorization. So, uh, here, first of all, how do you identify something as a square from the prime factorization? It's actually fairly easy to do. So, n is a square if and only if um, all of the. So, so I'm just always going to assume that n's, like whenever I talk about n, n is going to have uh, some prime factorization. Um, so n is a square if and only if all of the exponents in the prime factorization are e even. Okay, so all of these ei's are even. Um, why is that? Well, if n equals square of some number a squared, a itself has some prime factorization, but then when you square that prime factorization, you have to get this prime factorization by unique factorization. Uh, but I'm squaring it, so I'm essentially multiplying all the exponents by two, so these all are going to end up being even. Um, okay, well, um, wh what does that have to do with Talvin being odd? Well, let's just look at a formula for Talvin. It's e2 plus 1, you add 1 to all the exponents, multiply them together. Um, well, if all the ei are even, certainly this is going to be odd. Right? We're going to get a product of a bunch of odd numbers, which is odd. Um, okay, so that's um, this direction. Let's suppose tau of n is odd. So what if this whole thing is odd? This whole thing is odd. Uh, what can we conclude? Well, you know, if any one of these factors, so we've written tau of n as a product, that's a very useful thing to do, a product of integers. And if any one of these factors were even, then that would mean the whole thing is even, right? Because it would be two times some integer. 
So if this whole thing is odd, that actually means every single one of these has to be odd. So this has to be odd. This has to be odd. Um, everything has to be odd. But that, and that means, so see the whole thing being odd implies all these are odd. Now if all these are odd, that means all the EI are even, right? Because it's EI plus one is an odd number. Um, but by our fact, right, that's, um, that's going to be a square. So we've proven this. So Tn is odd exactly when n is a square. Um, okay, let's uh, let's do a quick computation. So so here's a good example. So how many? Let's just show how useful this is. So how many divisors does uh, the number? Uh, let's pick something with a lot of divisors, like a factorial maybe. Um, let's do 720, that's 6 factorial. How many divisors does 720 have? Um, okay, well let's find the prime factorization first. That's definitely going to be the, the, the right approach here. Um, so 720 is, uh, let's see, there are a bunch of 2's that we can pull out. Uh, let me think, so uh, we're going to get four twos and we're left with a 45 and so we're gonna get two threes and one five so there's my prime factorization for 720 how do we uh, count the number of divisors just use this formula All right so the number of divisors so tau of 720 is going to be uh, I add one to all the exponents four plus one I, I don't even care what the primes are right I'm just looking at the exponents here and the prime factorization. Uh, 1 plus 1, so this is what? 5 times 3 times 2, which is 30. So 720 has 30 divisors. That's quite a lot of divisors. Um, okay, let's go to another page. Um, here's a really fun kind of problem. So um, let's try to find. And just shows you how useful this formula is to also. So, so let, let's try to find all uh, all numbers less than or equal to, let's say, 100, with exactly eight divisors. Okay. Let's come up with a strategy first. So, one strategy would just be to Write down all the numbers, count the number of divisors, look at which ones have eight. Uh, that doesn't seem uh, too efficient. Um, so what we can do instead is we can try to write down this formula. So tau of n. n is the number I'm trying to find. I want this to be eight, by the way. right? I want tau of n to be eight. But we have a formula for tau of n. It's just this product. Okay. But now we have a product of integers equaling 8. The positive integers equaling 8. When you think about it, there aren't that many ways to do that. right? So we can have 8 is, uh, well, it could just be 8 itself. <laughs> you can see one term here. right? The E1, I guess, would be 7. Right? 7 plus 1 is 8. That could, that could be all that we have. Um, or we could have a, a 4 times 2. So maybe one of these could be a 4, one of these could be 2, and then we don't have anything else. Or we could have um, 2 times 2 times 2. We could have three terms in this product um, e with each one uh, giving me a 2. So there are, there are only a few cases that we have to consider here. So let's call this one case 1 this one case two and this one case three so case one first let's say our factorization looks like this uh, of this side here right, i'm not factoring a um any, any number in particular I'm just looking at this formula so um we have e1 plus one equals eight right we just have one term equaling eight one plus e1 has to be seven so we could have one prime, p1 to the 7, right? And that could be my number n. 
Well, is that possible? What if P1 is 2? Well, then we have 2 to the 7. But that's, I feel like that's over 100. That, yeah, that's 128, so that's already too large. So, po so 1 is not possible in this case. We could have another case. What if tau then, so we know it's equal to 8, but what if it were equal to 8 in this way, where we have exactly two terms here. So we have two primes now, p1 to the e1, p2 to the e2. And let's say this one equals 4, and this one equals 2. Well, that implies e1 has to be 3, and e2 has to be 1. Okay, so actually we're looking for factorizations of this shape. So we want p1 to the 3, p2 to the 1. And uh, so, so we're kind of working backwards. We're figuring out what the shape of the factorization is. Then we're generating into numbers really quick from that. Um, okay, well, what, what, let's just look at all the possibilities here. So uh, P1 could be 2. So I could have 2 to the 3 times my next prime has to be to the, one the first power. So I could have this. I could have this. I could have 2 to the 3 times 7. 2 to the 3 is 8. So we, these are all below 100. We can keep going. 2 to the 3 times 13, 2 to the 3 times um, 17. Have I gone too high? Uh, yeah, I think this one's actually 102, so that's too high. Uh, but what are these numbers? So 2 to the 3, is 8 times 3 is 24. Um, this one is 40. This one is 56. Uh, this one's 88. Uh, sorry about that. I think I got this one wrong. It should be 136. Um, and then this one here, 2 to 3 times 13, um, that's, that's 104. That's already over 100, so, so I don't need these last here. Um, but I've produced four numbers here. And I can actually keep going because this, we don't have to take 2 for P1. We could take 3. So we could do 3 to the 3. P1 is 3 now. P2 can be 2. That, that's not anything that we've done so far. Um, so 3 to the 3 is 27 times 2 is 54. Then we could do 3 to the 3 times 5. Notice I'm not allowed to do 3 to the 3 times 3, because that would be 3 to the 4. That's actually a, that would be a factorization of a different shape. This, this would actually have 5 divisors, not 8. So I, mean, I, need, I need distinct primes uh, in the, if, if I want to have a factorization like this. Um, okay, well, th this one's already well over 100, so... Uh, but I can do 54. I'll circle the numbers that we're getting. Um, if I do 5 to the 3, that's already over 100. So I'm done with all the factorizations of this shape. Now we can look at the third case. What if tau then, so it's equal to 8 again, but what if it were equal to 8 in this way? I have three factors of 2. And these are the, these are the only three cases, because I have a product of things equaling 8. Um, you might also say, why, well, why can't I add like a times 1 onto one of these? Um, and I can, but then uh, see, I would just get these factors of 1, and if one of these equals 1, the EI would correspond to it would just be 0. So that's not really giving me anything in the factorization. Um, so in this case, we want this to be 2, this to be 2, this to be 2. So that means we just have all the EIs equal to 1. And we're going to look for factorizations of this form, p1, p2, p3, just all the first power. OK, let's try to find some of those. Uh, so come over here again. So we have uh, 2 times 3 times 5. That works. 2 times 3 times 7. 2 times 3. I'm keeping the first two the same and I'm just seeing how high I can go with the third one. Uh, 2 times 3 times 13. 2 times 3 times uh, 17. Uh, that one should already be over 100, I think. That looks like it should be 102. So we can certainly take all of these. So this is 30, 42, 66, uh, 78. Uh, 78. Okay. We've produced four more numbers with exactly eight divisors. Um, okay, so we've gone as high as we can here. Let's try varying the second prime instead, so we'll do 2 times 5. And I can't do times 5 because that's a different factorization. Uh, 2 times 5 times 7, I'm allowed to do that. And 2 times 5 times 11, but that's already too high. So it's going to be 70. 
And then I can do two times seven times something higher than seven, but it's already gonna be too high. I'm only looking for ones less than or equal to 100. Uh, well, what else can I do? There's not much. Um, I suppose I can start with the uh, three instead. So I can do three times five times seven. Just taking small primes as I can. Um, and this one's already over 100, so. I think we're done. I think we found all of the numbers, less than 100, with exactly eight divisors. There's these ones here. So you'll agree that's a pretty efficient way to generate these. Take advantage of the fact that we have a product equal to this. And then this is telling us sort of the shapes of the factorizations we, we need to consider. Okay, well, let's move on to our, uh, our next multiplicative function. Um, so this will be our next arithmetic function. It turns out to be multiplicative as well. Uh, this one is called sigma of n. This is the sum of divisors, sum of all divisors, all the po positive ones at least. So sum of all divisors of n. Um, let's do an example. So sigma of 12, you're going to think sigma, I mean, it's S for sum, that's how I remember that. Uh, so this is, you're, you're not you're not counting them, you're taking a sum. You're going to add up all the divisors of 12, including 12 itself, so I don't want just the proper ones, I want all of them. Uh, that's 16 plus 12 is 28. So sigma of 12 is 28. Let's think about how we can maybe calculate this in general, because it would be nice if there were a formula just like we have for tau. Um, before I do that, I just want to mention uh, some notations. So this this one is sometimes also called sigma 1 of n. So I said before that tau is sometimes called sigma 0. So what, what what's the meaning of that? So we define sigma k of n to be the sum over all the divisors. So I'll just denote those d1, d2. Um, here we are. Let's call it sigma i of n, because I usually use k to indicate the number there. So sigma i of n is the sum of all the divisors, but each one you're raising to the ith power. And this turns out to be a useful thing that, that we, may, we, we might want to look at. Um, so if you take i to be 1, you just get the sum, sigma. Um, if you take i to be 0, you get uh, just a 1 for each divisor. So essentially you're counting and then you're adding them all up, right? Adding up all these ones. So this one is just, uh, yeah. So sigma, sigma zero of n is just tau. Sigma two of n would be uh, sums of the squares of the divisors, etc. Um, okay, well let's, let's look at 12 again. So 12 is, uh, it's, it's prime factorization looks like this. Two squared times three. And we can see all the divisors from here. Right? We can pick a two to the zero, two to one, two to the two. We could pick a three to zero or three to one. Those all give us divisors. I know a nifty way that um, I can actually get all those terms. Uh, so all the divisors um, in a sum. And the way to do that is, so I'm gonna take one, I'm gonna take, which is like two to the zero I'm going to take 2 to 1, 2 to 2. If I just have that sum alone, this will be the sum of the divisors of 2 squared. But I'm also allowed to take divisors of 3. The divisors of 3 look like 1 and 3. So 1 plus 3, 3 to 1, if you'd like. But look what happens if I multiply these together. I get 1 times 1, 1 times, uh, 1 times 3, plus 2 to 1 times 1, plus 2 to 1 times 3. It's sort of generating all possible combinations of these and adding them up. So this is exactly what I want to do. Uh, 2 squared times 3. These are exactly all the divisors of 12. So what is this? 1, 3, 2, 6, uh, 4, 12. And so this is what you can do in general, essentially. So you write your numbers of prime factorization. Um, 
let's do another example just to, to show before I write down the general formula. So let's do sigma of 720. Uh, what do we decide uh, that 720 was? So 720 was uh, 2 to the 4 times 3 squared times 5 to the 1. Um, okay, well, we're, we're going to use our trick again. So our trick is you write out all the possible divisors you can take from here, from the, from the 2. So you do 2 to 1, 2 to 2. I'm writing them as a sum. 2 to 3, 2 to 4. I'm going to multiply that by the sum of all the divisors from the 3. So I can do 3 to 1, 3 to 2. And you see why I'm doing this is because when you multiply these out, you're going to get five terms there, three terms there, I'm going to get 15 terms. Each one of them is going to sort of choose a combination of these exponents. So I, I'll just get a sum over all the divisors of these, these first two. And then I can multiply this by 1 plus 5 to the 1. So I'm allowed to take for the 5. And so this product, whatever it is, is... Uh, <laughs> the uh, sum of all the divisors of 720. Um, yeah, I mean, we can figure this out. So what is this? This is it's a geometric series, actually. So this should be 2 to 5 minus 1. It's 31. This term here is uh, what, 1 plus 3 plus 9. That's 13. This term here is 6. So it's 31 times 13 times 6, whatever that is. That's the sum of all the divisors of 720. Um, so in general, if uh, it turns out we're going to have a formula for this, uh, just like we did for tau. So if, if n equals p1 e to 1, p2 e to e2, etc., p k e to k, then sigma of n is, uh, we'll do 1, so we're choosing all the divisors of this P1. And then for each of these choices, we can multiply it by you know, all the divisors of everything else. So uh, 1 plus P1 to the 1 plus P1 to the 2 plus, I'm just kind of copying this here, uh, dot, 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 plus P1 to the E1. So we go all the way up to whatever that exponent is. We do the same for next, the next one, P2 to the 1 plus P2 to the 2 all the way up to p2 to the e2, uh, the, yeah, e2. And you keep going until we get to this last bit. So pk to the 1 plus pk to the 2 plus dot 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 plus pk to the ek. Um, there's also another way you can write this. So these are geometric series. And uh, you can recall maybe from, from an earlier lecture that we had to deduce a formula for this kind of thing. Right? We're taking powers of a single number. So, so this sum here, this first bit, is going to be P1 to the E1 plus 1 minus 1, like that, over P1 minus 1. Okay, and that'll be times P2 to the E2 mi plus 1 minus 1 over... P2 minus 1. Uh, and uh, you keep going. Go all the way up to PK to the EK plus 1 minus 1 over PK minus 1. So I'm just using the formula for geometric series. Sometimes it's actually more useful to just think about it as these, these, uh, these larger sums, but you um, can use either formula. Um, and uh, so, so another observation. So observe that the sigma of n is is multiplicative. What does multiplicative mean again? Uh, so multiplicative. It means that when you have a, a product, a b sigma of a b is equal to sigma of a times sigma of b, provided a and b are relatively prime. So this is if a and b are relatively prime. Um, but essentially, that's coming just from how we derived the formula, right? Because we're is a product over these different primes. If you have relatively prime 
a, a, a relatively prime product equaling n, you're just sort of splitting uh, this formula into two parts um, and then ultimately multiplying them together, which is what we're doing here in the formula anyway. Um, so this is a multiplicative function. Is it completely multiplicative? So is it completely multiplicative? It's multiplicative, but it turns out it's not completely multiplicative. Usually you can just uh, find that with a small example. So um, let's take two things that are not relatively prime. <laughs> so two times two is four. Is it true that sigma of four is sigma of two times sigma of two? Well, sigma of four, what is that? That's the sum of divisors of four. So that's one plus two plus four, uh, which is seven. Sigma of two is three, right? So sum of divisors of two, which is one, one plus two. Uh, so yeah, three times three, not equal to seven. So yeah, again, this formula only works if, um, if uh, your, your two numbers here are relatively prime. Because okay. we need to be able to get all the dividers from this kind of multiplication. That's why it works to partition it apart like this. Because all the divisors of this number has come from making choices of these separate exponents. Um, okay, great. Um, so here's a... Uh, by the way, so this is what we're going to be doing in, a, in the next lecture. We're going to be talking about perfect numbers and essentially using this property and, and basically this property alone uh, to classify all even perfect numbers. Um, but let's just recall, so uh, just to remind you, so a uh, number n is uh, called perfect if the sum of its proper divisors um, so if the sum of its proper divisors is n itself, right? But this is proper divisors. Sigma is talking about all divisors. So it seems like we can't really write this concept in terms of sigma. Um, but you really can because so if the sum of the proper divisors is n, Let's write, let's write the proper divisors, d2, up to whatever, dk. So if these are the proper divisors of n, well, what's, what are we missing out? We're, we're just missing n itself. So if we add n itself, this is going to equal, well, this bit here is already n. We add n itself, we get all divisors, we get n plus n is 2n. So the sum of all the divisors is 2n for a perfect number. So in other words, it's just uh, rephrasing this in terms of our new function sigma. So number is called perfect if sigma of n equals 2n. Not equals n, but equals 2n because we want the number itself uh, when we're talking about sigma counts all divisors. Okay, so I'd quickly just like to introduce one final uh, arithmetic function, and it's called the Mobius uh, mu function. So this is mu of n. Um, so this is the Mobius mu function. And um, it has a bit of a weird definition. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd actually like to motivate it first um, before I define it. So motivation. There's one possible motivation for this function. Um, let's, let's try to count primes. So let's count uh, primes less than or equal to 100. So in other words, uh, we want to find pi of 100. Remember, pi is the prime counting function. Um, we said earlier that it's equal to 25. Um, but what if we didn't know that? We want a strategy for counting primes. Let's go back to our civil veritasenes. Um, well, let's just try to write out the same idea that we did here. So uh, what do we do uh, in a civ? We, we took all multiples of 2 and got rid of those. So let's say we're starting with 100 numbers. We're going to subtract off all the multiples of 2. So how many multiples of 2 we have? 
multiples of two. Okay, which I guess will be a hundred over two. And then we subtract off the number of multiples of of three. How many of those are there? Oh, I don't want to say 100 over 3 because that's not an integer, but uh, it's the, the quotient. It's, uh, it's what you get when you divide 100 by 3 uh, if you ignore the remainder. So I'm going to put this uh, sign, which means take the floor of what you get. So it's 33.3 repeating, but I'm just going to. There, there are 33 multiples of 3. Um, we don't need to do anything with the multiples of 4, right? So I'm just going to write. I'm going to write plus 0 times. The number of multiples of four. I'm actually going to write this as minus one times, minus one times. I'm writing this in kind of a funny way, but um, okay. What do we need to do next? We need to subtract off the number of multiples of five. Uh, let's just recall really quick. Why don't we need to uh, cross out the multiples of four? Those are sort of entirely subsumed by two. We already crossed out all the multiples of two. And four is just two squared. Um, let's cross out all the multiples of five next. Okay, so we need, so if we want to count, we need uh, to do this was a hundred over five. I don't need a floor function there, but it's putting it just to be safe. Um, okay, and well, we also need to subtract out the multiples of seven. Um, whatever that is. Etc. Um, and actually, after that, we're done because we only need to check primes up to the square root of 100. So if it was something's divisible by 11, it would be 11 times something that we already checked. However, this gives you the wrong answer if you calculate it. Um, what is this, by the way, 14? Uh, this, this, this will give you the wrong answer. See, if we subtract these out, we're, these, these already are adding up to something bigger than 100. So we're going to get a negative number, which doesn't make any sense. So the problem here is actually, um, in our picture, it was fine, actually, because we just cared about the primes. But when we're counting them with an equation like this, we have to take into account that some numbers we actually crossed out more than once. Like this 12 here, this 6 here. Uh, in fact, any multiple of 6. See, 6 is 2 times 3. So we crossed all multiples of 6 out twice. We didn't want to do that. So why don't we add them back in? So I'm going to add back in the multiples of 6. Multiples of 6, OK? Or 2 times 3. I guess I'm going to do plus whatever that is, 100 over 6. Uh, multiples of 8 we don't care about because 8 is just the power of 2. Uh, multiples of 9, those are entirely just uh, dealt with here. Uh, but multiples of 10, see 10 is 2 times 5. And we have a similar problem with the multiples of 10. I mean you can't see it here, but like technically I went over this line twice. <laughs> so I crossed out the multiples of 5, but they're already crossed out when I crossed out the multiples of 2. And here in my equation, they're actually counted for here and here. So I need to Let's see, I subtracted them twice. I, I only wanted to subtract them once, so I need to add them back in. And you see we're getting some, some kind of weird sum here. Um, and then you have, to, you have to keep doing this. So a three, and f uh, 3 times 5, so we cross out the multiples of 15 too many times. We need to add them back in. Um, so this is looking uh, kind of mysterious. Uh, like what coefficients we have here, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna write down the coefficients that we're getting here. So in other words, when I'm dealing with multiples of of you know, d for some divisor, let's call it n. Uh, so n be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm not gonna write this whole number. I just care about the coefficient. So we, I guess uh, this we can think of as one times a hundred. So my coefficient is one. I'm going to call that coefficient mu of n, by the way. Um, when n is 2, so when we, said we need to subtract out the multiples of 2. So I have a minus 1, I have a minus 1 on this term. I have a 0 on this term, because it wasn't giving us anything new. I have a minus 1 here. I have a plus 1 on the 6, so this is plus 1. 
Uh, with a seven, I have a minus one. The eight and a nine, we decided wasn't giving us anything new. Uh, with a ten, I have a plus one, and you can kind of keep going uh, with this. Like for example, um, <laughs> if we're doing something kind of funny here. Uh, we subtracted off the multiples of two, the multiples of three, the multiples of five. We added back in all the multiples of two times three, all the multiples of two times five, and all the multiples of three times five. But what about the multiples of two times three times five? We sort of subtracted these off three times. We're adding them back in three times here, here, and you know, we have the term for 15. But we, we don't want that. Like, we want to get rid of those. So I need to subtract these out an additional time. So if I go all the way up to 30, uh, we're going to have a minus 1. And essentially what we're doing here is, this is a constant you might have seen before. This is called the, 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 the principle of inclusion-exclusion. Inclusion-exclusion. So you realize you're, you're sort of double counting certain things. And then you try to add them back in. But then you, then you add too many things back in and you need to take take things back out again um, so but that, that's the idea um, we can in theory write a sum like this but we have to be very careful about it and it turns out these coefficients here are they form a very interesting multiplicative function even called the Mobius mu function and uh, to, to really define this so now I'm going to define this but a definition might make a little more sense now that we saw where it came from so First of all, I'm going to say it's zero if um, we don't really get anything new. So, so we have a th square here. We have a third power with uh, of the eight. Um, essentially, the condition you want is you want you want to ignore the multiples if your number is is is, is not square free. If it's divisible by some square. So if some square divides in, and in fact, you can even say it's the square of a prime. Because if a square divides in, then take one of its prime factors. Uh, so if p divides in for some uh, p, in other words, a uh, sort of mathematical term would be, so i.e. n is not square free. <laughs> square free means that no square divides your number. Um, yeah, zero if there's any square whatsoever that divides our number, um, except for one. <laughs> um, but yeah, one is not prime. And then this is the part of the formula that's going to look weird. It's going to be a negative one to um, some power here. Okay, so what is this power going to be? It's going to be. Um, okay, so, so, so essentially it's going to be the number of primes in my factorization. So here, 6 was 2 times 3. So that case was already covered by the cases for 2 and 3. So we want to flip the sign. But then for 30, we wanted to do a minus 1 again, because that's 2 times 3 times 5. And it turns out you want to continue this pattern. So if, uh, yeah, this will be in the case where n is square free. And what's the case? So n is just p1 times p2, some prime product. There's no see that all the exponents have to be one, or else I would I would I would set it equal to zero. Um, and yeah, k is simply the number of prime factors I have here. Great. So I just want to um, show you this function because it is quite an important function in number theory, um, and a study of these multiplicative functions in general. Uh, there's something called Mobius inversion, which which uses this this uh, Mobius mu function. Um, it's also actually used in the uh, study of the Riemann zeta function. It's the subject of the Riemann hypothesis. Um, and it's a bit of a strange function, so it only has three possible values, <laughs> 0, 1, and negative 1. Um, OK, uh, in the next lecture, we're going to classify all perfect numbers, at least all the even perfect numbers. And uh, the main ingredient in the proof is, is going to be this observation that sigma of n, the sum of all divisors, is a multiplicative function. Okay, hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thanks for watching.